I want to welcome everybody here today, everybody who's on one of our multi-site campuses all around the state of New Mexico, also our little campus out in Belize as well. We're thankful for you. Welcome to those who are watching via the stream and on TV. We're glad you're a part of the Sagebrush family as well. You know, everything we do around here is for him. And we shared last weekend, if you weren't here, if you weren't a part of the, of the most ambitious goal that we've ever had in the history of our church. And it's our M1 Capital Campaign where we want to build 50 churches and do 50 projects overseas in a one-year span of time. And I just want to tell you that the, it's been overwhelming, the emails and the phone calls that we've had. There are so many people that are so excited because every dime we're going to raise for the M1 Capital Campaign not a single cent stays here at Sagebrush. It all goes overseas to our partners. So if you weren't here last week and you didn't get a commitment card, make sure you stop by the information table and get a commitment card. If you're online watching at home, you can go to m1.sagebrush.church and you can download a commitment card. We can be all a part of making an impact and leaving our world in better shape than the way that we found it. I got a letter this past week from a friend of mine that goes to our church. It was a letter letter with a check in it. You want to really make your pastor happy, send me a letter with a check. All right, that's always a good thing. He said he was watching the service online. He promised his wife, she passed away last year, he promised his wife that he would never miss another service. So he couldn't come on that particular weekend, but he watched last weekend service on Saturday night in his house. And he was talking about, you know, we we're talking about Malachi chapter one and giving our best to the one who gave his best for us. And I explained about the M1 capital commitment. And he's sitting there alone in his front room, and he looks over at the mantle, and he sees his wife. And he said in the letter, he said, if my wife was sitting with me, she would have looked at me after that message, and she just said, we need to give our best to the one who gave his best for us. And so inside, he wrote a check for $100,000 for our M1 Capital Campaign. Isn't that exciting? And I said, can I share your story? He said, oh, yeah, you can share my story, but don't tell anybody who I am. And I appreciated that. But some of you have been blessed a lot. And you can take one of these projects we're going to show you, and you can say, you know what, I'm just going to fund that one myself. And here's what's great about the M1 Capital Campaign. Whether you give a lot or you give a little, you'll have an opportunity to go overseas and actually see it to see your money at work, to see the lives that were changed, to see the impact that you made. So I want you to meet today some of the pastors that we're going to attempt to help them by building physical structures for them. Take a look at this. With your help this year, we're going to plant and provide facilities to 50 plus churches globally. We've broken down these projects across 24 countries into three different parts of the world, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Check out what some of our partners in Africa have to say about these new projects. My name is Ife, I'm pastor here. As you know, the Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations. So our biggest project is to come here in this community, winning people for Christ, make disciples and build a church. Have a place to call church will be a blessing for this community. And the excitement people will have we allow them to impact the other village and uh, win more soul for praise. Hello and greetings. My name is Pastor Dominic Ekwe. I'm pastor here in Togo in Africa. I want you to know that this project will not only change the course of human history for the people here, it's going to redefine the community because they will have a place that they can worship in, a place they can, they can find and experience the really love of God. Alone, I can do that, but together, yes, we can. Kabore Ferdina. My name is Ferdinand Kabore. I lead a cell group in order to lead people to the Lord. But with the prayers and the songs, with the music, the drums, it upsets a lot of people, the noise. And so that's why we ask all those that can come and help us to help us get a building, a temple. Every person that is available can really help us out. They can help us spiritually, materially, financially, and socially. 
That's uh, Safu Adu, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church at Forokrom. And we have come to the next village called Finyaso to start a church. So God has provided us this land and we are praying that you will help us to get a funds to build this church for the people here. And we are sure that the, those who have come in when they get the church, we will train them so that they can go to the next villages to proclaim the gospel there. We thank you so much for helping us here in Ghana. These are just a few of our projects throughout Africa, and we have many more. If you'd like to check those out, you can visit m1.sagebrush.church or the Sagebrush app. With our help, these churches will make it possible to help surrounding villages and even send out missionaries and pastors to new places that haven't been reached yet. God is providing the opportunity to share His Word, His gift, and His light across Africa. Are you ready to be a part of this story that's about to be written? You can visit m1.sagebrush.church or check out the free Sagebrush app today to find out more about the M1 Capital Campaign and donate today. So it's a, it's a one-year campaign above and beyond our normal tithes and offerings to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know, a lot of churches never even attempt something like this. But my goodness, I don't want to be the pastor of a church that all we do is we get together and we huddle and we talk about the plays we should run and we don't make the impact we should make. And we've been blessed. And so we should be a blessing to other people along the way. And I know something about you. I know you'll take these cards. I know you'll pray over them. You'll ask the Lord what he would have you to do. And I know that you'll be faithful. And we will leave these parts of the world in better shape than the way that we found it. And boy, the joy you're going to feel when you go on that mission trip and you see how God used the funds that you provided to make such a wonderful impact in the lives of other people. I am so excited for what God's going to do in 2022. All right, let's get into, oh yeah, let's go, yeah. Let's get into the message today. Uh, one day, President Lincoln was in a carriage, and he was riding along with a colonel from Kentucky. And the colonel from Kentucky offered him some whiskey. And Abraham Lincoln said, no, thank you. I don't drink. Well, they went a little bit farther down the way, and the colonel pulled out a cigar, and he offered Abraham Lincoln a cigar as well. And Abraham Lincoln said, no, thank you. I don't smoke. Well, they continued on their little path in silence for a few more hundred yards, and then Abraham Lincoln broke the silence. He said, Colonel, can I tell you a story? And the colonel said, by all means, Mr. President. He said, when I was a little boy, about the age of nine, my mom grew very, very ill. And the doctors came and told us that she didn't have very much longer to live. So she called me by her bedside, and she said, Abe, I want you to be a good little boy. I want you to be a good little boy that grows up to be a good man. And I want you to stay away from tobacco, and I want you to stay away from alcohol. Abraham, will you promise me that you'll stay away from tobacco, you'll stay away from alcohol? And Abraham Lincoln looked at the colonel and said, up to this day, up to this moment in time, I have kept my promise, I have kept my word to my mom. Now, would you say at this moment I should break my promise to my mom? And the colonel said, absolutely not. I think it's one of the most wonderful promises a person could ever make. He said, I would give $1,000 if I would have made a promise to somebody else like that. I'd be a much better man today than I am. Promises. Keeping your word. Cross your heart. Hope to die. Stick a needle in your eye. Keeping a promise, right? Being a person of integrity, saying what you're going to do, and then following through on what you say you're going to do. And God loves it when we make promises, and God loves it when we keep promises, because our God is a, is a, a promise-making, a promise-keeping God. All throughout Scripture, when you read through the Bible, you read about one promise after another that God makes. God promises Noah. He says, listen, I will never flood the earth again. And a symbol of that promise is that there'll be a rainbow in the sky. And God has kept his word, hasn't he? God, God promised Abraham, he said, you leave everything, you come and follow me. You be obedient to me, and I will make you the father of a great nation. And just the mere fact that the nation of Israel still exists today is a testimony to the faithfulness and the promises of God. Sometimes God's promises are positive. Sometimes his promises are disciplinary. For example, God told Adam and Eve, if you eat from this tree of this forbidden fruit, you will never set foot in the Garden of Eden. And sure enough, they never did again. God said to Moses, because you've lost your temper one too many times, that's it. That's it. You're not setting a pinky toe into the promised land. And sure enough, he didn't get to go into the promised land. 
God, uh, God promised the children of Israel that they would inherit the promised land. And that's where they still live, isn't it? God made promises to us that a Messiah would come to take away the sins of all mankind. 300, over 300 prophecies. It's as if God says, when you find the person who fulfills all these prophecies, you found the right Messiah. And Jesus came and fulfilled every promise of the Lord. Jesus promised us that he would die for our sins, and he did. Jesus promised that he would rise again from the dead, and he did. Jesus promised that any of us who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus promises us that right now he's preparing a place for us in heaven to be with him forever, that we're going to a place where there is no more sickness, there is no more suffering, there is no more pain, there is no more disease, because our God is a promise-making and promise-keeping God. God loves it when we make promises, and God loves it when we keep our promises. Well, we're looking at the book of Malachi, right? And last week we saw the first chapter, and God was upset. Through the prophet Malachi, he said, listen, you're, you're not bringing your best sacrifices. Some of you don't know about the Old Testament sacrificial system. If you wanted to be forgiven of your sins in the Old Testament, a lamb had to die on behalf of your sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So you were to bring to the temple the best lamb that you had, the perfect lamb, the blemishless lamb that you had, and you would offer it to the priest. He would kill the lamb. The blood of the lamb would be poured out. They would put the lamb on the altar, and the aroma of the meat would be an aroma that was pleasing to God. It was a reminder to the people of the consequence of sin. Someone has to die for your sin. But we found out last week they weren't bringing their best offerings, were they? They weren't bringing their best sacrifices. They weren't bringing their best lambs. They were bringing their diseased lambs. They were bringing their crippled lambs. They were bringing their blind lambs for a sacrifice. Look at what God says here in Malachi 2 verse 3. He says, I'll smear on your faces the dung from your festive, festival sacrifices and you'll be carried off with it. That sounds a little extreme, don't you think? But you can hear the anger in the voice of God. You can hear the hurt in the voice of God. And so what we said last week, we said we're going to give our best to the one who gave his best for us. And it's not just about Sunday morning. It's not just about a one-hour-a-week deal. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're going to give our best. Whatever we say, whatever we do, we're going to give our best to the one who gave his very best to me. Now we're into chapter, chapter 2, and God's upset about something that people are doing. They're not keeping their vows. They're not keeping their promises. And the one thing that God really hones in on is they're not keeping their wedding vows. They're not keeping their marriage vows. Look at what happens here. He says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings. You ask why? It's because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth because you've broken faith with her, though she's your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Think about it, because our God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. He expects people who follow him to keep their word and to keep their promises as well. And back in this time period of Malachi, people were divorcing their wives over the stupidest reasons. The, the, the wife would get them mad, burn their supper, something would go wrong, and they'd say, you know what, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And all they had to do was go down to the temple, tell the priest, hey, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. If they said it three times, they were divorced. And God was upset. God was angry. He says, you just throw away your marriage vows. You throw away your commitment. You throw away what you say you're going to do. And you're being a poor reflection of who I am. Let me explain something to you. Marriage is more than just a civil union. It is the putting together of two souls. And God is there in the center of it. Do you remember when you stood before your family and your friends and before God Almighty? And you made a promise to the other person that no matter what might come your way, no matter how much bad stuff might happen to you in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor, for better or for worse, I pledge you my love till death do us part. Two Christian people come together. God expects them to keep their promise. God expects them to keep their word because them being together is an example of the faithfulness of God. I was reading this book by Bob Russell. He writes this. A Christian marriage is supposed to be a visual aid to the world. This is how God loves us. Even though we may become apathetic, God draws closer. Even though we're not perfect, God's still committed to us. 
even though we're not lovable, God is still faithful to us. And the world ought to be able to look at a Christian marriage and say they love each other as God loves them. With an in spite of kind of love, in spite of their inconsistency, in spite of the moments they drive each other crazy, they can count on each other. This is what I want from my home. I respect their commitment. A Christian couple comes together under holy matrimony. It is an example of the faithfulness of God, the determination of God, the perseverance of God, that no matter what comes our way, nothing will separate us. I will love you with everything that I've got. Bob continued in his book and talked about a friend of his by the name of Russ. Russ and his wife have been married for over 40 years. His wife recently was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. She's beginning to forget things. And Bob says it's just such a testament to watch Russ take care of his wife. She's a little slower now and she's not as agile as she once was and she gets confused pretty easily. And Russ is always there patiently, calmly leading her, guiding her step by step, helping her through her confusion. He was talking to Russ the other day and uh, Russ said, we had a bad night, Bob. Bob said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, we were at a party and we were at a party with a bunch of our friends and he's been friends of ours for 20, 30 years. And my wife couldn't remember one of our friends' names. And she was devastated. She just couldn't believe she couldn't come up with his name because she knew him, but she just couldn't come up with his name. They'd been friends for so very, very long. So we had to leave the party early because she was so upset. So we got into the car and I was driving her home and she's just weeping, tears just pouring down from her face. She said, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe I forgot his name. And then in horror, she looked at her husband and she said, what are we gonna do when the day comes when I don't know your name? And Russ looked at his wife and said, don't you worry about it, honey, because I'll never forget your name. Now, that's a picture of a Christian marriage. It's a, it's a marriage that says, no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, we will go through it together. I will stand by you. I will be by you. And that's a testimony to the rest of the world because that's, a, that's an, a, another kind of love, isn't it? That kind of perseverance, that kind of, that kind of endurance, no matter what comes our way, you can count on me. So God says it's very important that we stay together because we're an example about the faithfulness of God. But there's another reason God doesn't want us to end our relationships. It's because God is seeking godly offspring. Christianity is one generation from being extinct. And when you get married in a Christian marriage and then you have children, your job, your responsibility, parents, is to raise your children in the ways and teachings of the Lord. And the church will come alongside you. We'll help you any way we can. But we only see your kid one hour a week. We can only do so much one hour a week. But you're with them all the time. So is Jesus the centerpiece of your home? Are you seeking the Lord together? Are you reading scripture together and praying together and showing and talking about how God is moving in your very life to where your kids look at their mom and dad's faith and say, I want what they have. So, so Christian marriage is very, very important to God. And so that's why he says here in Malachi chapter 2, I hate divorce. Now, some of you are here today, and you've gotten a divorce. Some of you are watching at home, and you've gotten a divorce, and you're like, oh, crud. All the days to show up. Really? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Todd. Appreciate it. I already felt bad enough. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. When God says, I hate divorce, he does not say, I hate divorce people. Now, I want you to get that. Because some of you have been treated so poorly by other Christians when the relationship ended. And they treated you as if you were some second-class citizen, as if you were less than. And I'm so sorry that that happened to some of you. God loves you. God has a plan for your life, and God will never, ever give up on you. And he, he, he sees beautiful things still in you. He says, I hate divorce. He doesn't say, I hate divorce people. Do you know who else hates divorce? Every person who's ever gone through a divorce hates divorce too. I've got lots of friends who, who, have, who have gone through divorces. They're the sweetest people on the face of the earth. And they have regrets like all of us have. And so I called them on the phone in preparation for this message. I said, you got you to explain to me what it was like getting a divorce. And, and this is what with one of the threads that came through the conversations that I had. It, this is what I heard again and again. They said, I thought the divorce would be over soon. 
I thought it would be over like two or three months. That's all it would be. But what I found to be true is that there's ripple effects that continue on and on and on, even to this day. And I've been divorced for 15, 20 years. I said, can you explain to me what kind of ripple effects you're talking about? Because I know I'm going to be talking to some people who are contemplating this. I'm going to be talking to some people who are on the very edge of should we stay together or should we go ahead and end this relationship? What were some of the things that were a shock to you that you were surprised at the depth of how, how bad it really got? And this is the list that they gave me. First off, they said their finances were strained. That makes sense. You go from one household to two households. They said it took a long time to recover financially. They also said this. They said there was tension every time they saw their ex. It didn't matter if it was two, three months after the divorce. It was two, three years after the divorce. If you had kids and you had to see the ex, there was always tension every, almost every single time. They said their friendships were now fractured. They said, we were shocked at the number of friends that we lost because we were couple friends. And now that we weren't together anymore, they didn't know what to do, so they went on their merry way, and we had to find a whole new support group for ourselves. They said there were visitation issues and how to handle the holidays. Who gets the kids on Christmas? Who gets them the day after Christmas? What about spring break? What are we doing for this? What are we doing for that? And then they said when the, one spouse doesn't do what they said they would do, doesn't come through the way, then the tension just rises back up again. This is the thing they said. They said, we had to work through all the issues that our kids were going to have. They thought their kids were more resilient than they were, is what I heard over and over again. Some of their kids took personal responsibility for the divorce. They thought they were the reason that mom and dad separated. Even though mom and dad said, no, it has nothing to do with you, they still took personal ownership of that, and they became very insecure, and their self-esteem began to tank. And many of the families that I talked to said we had to put our kids into counseling. And we thought that would just be a short-term thing. But some of our kids are still wounded to this very day over what took place in our married relationship. And then they, they, they said this. Later in life, there's stress when the kids get married or when grandchildren come on the scene. What should be one of the happiest moments of their life is their wedding day. And then both exes come together and there's there's tension, and the child finds themselves once again kind of in the tug-of-war rope between the two because there's issues between them. They said these things never go away. Now, now, do you understand why God says he hates divorce? But he does not say that he hates you. So I, I want to say this again to you. You are loved by God, and you are loved here. And we are all sinners at the foot of the cross. And none of us is better than any of us. And if you're going through a rough bout, if you've gone through a rough season, the church shouldn't be the place that you run away from. The church should be the place that you run to for comfort, for hope, and for healing. And I hope that you will always find that amongst us here at Sagebrush. That our arms would always be wide open and that we would realize, yet by the grace of God, there goes the likes of me. So I'm sitting here in my office, and I'm working on this message, and I'm thinking, man, I'm at the midway point of this message, and do I, I can go negative, continue to go kind of, it's kind of heavy, just keep going, or we can go be more positive. So we're going to go negative, so here we go, all right? Um, <laughs> I just met it around. Here's what I know about the past. You can't do much about it. You can ask people to forgive you for it. You can ask God to forgive you for it, but at some point in time, you've got to move on. So let's talk about moving on from this so that you don't ever have to go through this pain. Because I know there's some single people here and, and you're looking for someone to spend the rest of your life with. And so I want to share with you how you can make certain that the person that you choose and the person that chooses you, that your marriage endures. That you have perseverance, you have staying power, that the word divorce would never come out of your mouth. And for those of you who are married today and you're in this relationship, I want to talk to you about six things that I think if you do these six things, you'll never utter the words divorce ever again. You won't be hanging by a thread ever again if both of you would do this. Now listen, this is not a list that you're going to evaluate your spouse on. I don't want to see any elbows flying, okay? I've seen that enough times in my time. Hey, you need to listen and pay attention. This is talking to you. Don't do that. Don't do that. You give yourself an elbow. That'll be a new thing for us. I, I needed that, right? This is for you to evaluate what you bring to the table. You cannot control your spouse, but you can control you. 
You can't change your spouse, but you can change you. So we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at how it starts out. It says, a wife of noble character who can find. She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Now, the proverb starts off realistic enough, doesn't it? It says a good woman's hard to find. A good man is hard to find. That's true. A wife of noble character is worth more than rubies. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Now, what's he talking about here? He's talking about a person who's selfless. So you're in a dating relationship. You're looking for someone who's selfless, who puts the needs of other people ahead of themselves. You're in a married relationship. You're supposed to put the needs of your spouse ahead of yourself. You're constantly thinking, how can I serve them? How can I show them in a tangible way how much they mean to me, how much I love them? There was a song that came out years ago by the Proclaimers. The chorus goes something like this. I would walk 500 miles. <laughs> and I would walk 500 more just to be the man who walks 1,000 miles to fall down at your door. Da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da. I love that part. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you said that's romantic. That's a beautiful song. I love that song too, Todd. Let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody who serves anybody like that? Anybody who's walked a thousand miles to be the one to fall down at your door? I don't know anybody who's ever walked a thousand miles to do something like that. But I do know one person who walked five miles. My mom was a cake decorator. And uh, one night she was uh, at a mall and she was in the basement teaching her class and she didn't know that there was a snowstorm that was going on. It wasn't in the forecast. One of the things, if you've ever lived in the Midwest, they have a little saying that says, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it'll change. That's the way it is in the Midwest. Well, sure enough, it changed. My dad had come home from work. He was watching some television, looking out the picture window, and he saw the blizzard start, the layer of ice to begin. And then the snow began to come. And it snowed so hard. I remember the snowstorm. It snowed so hard that you couldn't even see the end of your uh, front yard. And my dad grew concerned for my mom's safety. He knew she wasn't very good with ice and, and snow, just like no one is. And he thought, you know, I, I, I need to go and I need to take care of her. But he didn't want to drive his car to the mall because he didn't want to leave a, a car at the mall overnight for fear that it would get stolen. So this is what my dad did. My dad was an electrician, so he worked outside a lot. He had a snowsuit. And he put his snowsuit on. And he walked five miles to get to my mall. And he fell down. Along that walk, more times than he could count. When my mom came out of the cake decorating class, not realizing there was a blizzard that was going on outside, she opened up the door, felt the breeze, saw the blizzard that was happening, immediately felt anxiety, felt stress, thought, oh my goodness, how in the world am I going to get home safely? Can you imagine her relief when she came around the corner and she saw her car with my dad standing next to it, scraping off the windows, already getting it heated up? For 52 years, I had a front row seat to watch my mom and dad serve each other, to love each other, to put the needs of the other person ahead of themselves till the day my dad breathed his last breath on this earth. He loved my mom with every fiber of his being. So you're dating somebody who's kind of a narcissist? Let that be a red flag. <laughs> Just throw it on the field. That's a penalty right there, don't you? Run, Forrest, run from the narcissist, will you? Run! Person who thinks the world centers around themselves, you don't want to be a fixer. Don't you tell yourself you can change them. Only God can change them. You say, you're not changed yet. I'm out of here. Okay, that's what you do. You say, well, I'm married to a narcissist. Sorry. <laughs> if, if, if you're the narcissist in the relationship and you sit around lazy on your couch, belching all the time, waiting for everybody else to serve you. Can I let you know a little secret? You are not the center of the universe. God is. And God sent his son Jesus, and he came as a servant. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You put the needs of your spouse ahead of yourself. Every morning you wake up and say, what's one thing? What's one tangible thing I can do to serve the needs of my spouse? You get two people doing that. 
You're going to have a phenomenal marriage. You're never going to utter the words divorce. Let me give you the second thing. It's to be an encourager. This passage says she brings him good. That means she's his biggest fan. He is her biggest fan. Listen to these Proverbs. Proverbs 19, verse 13. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. Proverbs 21, verse 9. Better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 21, 19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Proverbs 27, 15. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with a hand. Some of the ladies are like, thanks a lot. (laughs) Couldn't just give us one verse, you rapid fire four. (laughs) Wouldn't you agree, ladies, that it would be quite easy to say a quarrelsome husband is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining him is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. This applies just as much to men as it does to women. You don't want to be that person. You, you don't want to be the jerk, do you? You don't want to be the person who's constantly complaining and nagging and being sarcastic and cynical and constantly nitpicking. You don't want to be the person who can't admit when you're wrong, that you won't reconcile, you won't say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You want to use your words to build other people up, don't you? Let me let you know a little secret that's probably not much of a secret to you, but you're probably not motivated by someone nagging you, are you? My wife can't motivate me by nagging me. She starts nagging me. I don't listen to things she has to say. I feel like I'm Charlie Brown in school. I'm not listening to that garbage. I'm not listening to that. I'm not going to do anything. You nag me. But when she builds me up, when she encourages me, when she says, I believe you can do it. I know you can do it. I love you so much. Oh, look, you did that so well. I just rise up. And I will exceed my wife's expectations every single time. Let me rephrase that. In my mind, I will exceed (laughs) my wife's expectations every single time. So you're dating somebody who's a nag. Nothing you ever do is good enough. I mean, they're constantly complaining and criticizing you. Let that be a red flag. And if you're married, this is your prayer. God set a guard over my mouth that I'm not sin against you or anybody else. May I only say words that build my spouse up. May I only say words that encourage them. May I be my spouse's biggest fan. Let me give the third one, hard worker. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's dark. She provides food for her family and provides for her servant girls. A couple got married and they went off on their honeymoon. Daughter came back from the honeymoon, called her mom in a panic. Mom said, what in the world's going on? What's wrong? What, what's, the matter? what's the matter? Was the honeymoon bad? She said, oh, mom, mom, the honeymoon was wonderful. It was very romantic. It was great. But then we got back home and he started using all these four-letter words. And mom said, four-letter words? What kind of four-letter words is he using? She said, words like cook, <laughs> dust, wash. Mom said, I'll be over in 10 minutes. <laughs> be careful of the person who's not a hard worker. Be careful of the person who sucks off the government. You're able-bodied, get a job. And you be careful of the person who doesn't put hard work in your relationship. You're looking for someone you're going to marry, and they're already being lazy in that relationship. They're not dating you anymore. They're not taking you out anymore. Let that be a red flag. And you're married, and you've gotten lazy, and you've gotten complacent. Let this be your wake-up call. It's time to step up. And it's time to be the person that you said you were going to be, the husband you said you were going to be, the wife you said you were going to be when you said, I do. You put every effort of energy that you can in your married relationship. Let me give the next one. Good with money. She considers a field and she buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Before the pandemic, the average American was over $8,000 in credit card debt. Well, since the government started printing all this money, now the average American is $5,600 in credit card debt. So at least we use the money to pay down our credit cards. Well, I guess that's good. (laughs) Number one cause of divorce, first five years of marriage, money. Number one cause. 
Number two caused a divorce after the first five years. They never got on the same page financially, and eventually it just completely shipwrecked their entire relationship, and they ended up in a divorce. Some of you would love to be a part of this M1 capital campaign. You can't do it. You know why you can't do it? Because you're in too deep debt. And you're sick of it. You're sick of every bill that comes in. You're sick of having more month than you have money. I want to help you. Because when the next campaign comes, or comes along the way and you really want to be a part of a move of God, you want to be in a financial situation to be able to be a part of it. We got this class called Dollars and Cents. We offer it from time to time. We have helped hundreds and hundreds of couples get their financial house in order. And here's the great thing about the class. It's free. So you don't have to go in more debt to be there. Isn't that nice? Church provides all the materials for you free at cost because we want to help you get out from under that burden. You got to get on a budget. You got to understand what, what the purpose of tithing is. We're just going to give you the biblical explanation of how God views money and how we're supposed to be a good manager of the resources that God's entrusted to our care. And couples who have gone through this it is a game changer for them. You can sign up for that on our app. You can sign up for that on the website. I hope that you'll take advantage of it. We're even going to offer it online so anybody watching anywhere could be a part of this class. So we hope that you'll do that. But they're good with money. So if you've got somebody who every single dime they make is a dime they want to spend, let that be. Oh, that went to the ground. A uh, red flag. <laughs> How about this one? They're compassionate. She opens her arms to the poor, extends her hands to the needy. Write this one down. The couple who serves together stays together. So here, here, here's the question we had to ask ourselves. Is the person that you're going to be with, how are they using their time, their talent, and their energy for the kingdom of God? How are they being the hands and feet of Jesus? And in your married relationship, how are you serving the Lord together? How are you being a difference maker for the things of God and for the kingdom of God? And if you're not doing these kinds of things, friends, let that be a red flag. Let me give you the last one. They've got godly wisdom. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let me talk to the single folks for just a second. Don't settle for a hot bod. Because some of that's all you're settling for. Do we have to settle for a hot bod? Can't we also have someone who's also hot for God? <laughs> you ever see those TikToks where uh, they show a movie star in their 20s and now they're in their 70s and you're like, whoa. <laughs> There's no way that's the same person. <laughs> what happened? few too many Twinkies, I'm thinking, you know, something like that. If the only thing you're doing is you're marrying somebody because they physically give you a, a, a jolt, and that's the only reason you're with somebody, it's all going to fade. It's all going to sag. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to wrinkle. Gravity will take over, okay? I'm just telling you that right now. What, what, what you're looking for is somebody who loves the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. I mean, you want somebody you're attracted to. Let there be no doubt about that. You don't want somebody, like, you don't want that, okay? Um, <laughs> God doesn't want that for you. Like, oh. Every time I see you, eh. But you love the Lord, so okay, close my eyes. Okay, um, I went too far. Went too far, Lord. I'm sorry about that one. Went too far. Moving on. <laughs> You're looking for somebody who loves the Lord their God with everything they've got. You know, the, the greatest gift of my wife is that she loves Jesus so much. And so when I say, hey, let's read the Bible together, she's always excited. And we read it every night. And when we pray together, one night's my night, next night's her night. It's just so great to have that kind of oneness between two people. So if you're dating somebody and they're not interested in the things of God, let that be a red flag. And if you're married, I thought you were Christian. Why wouldn't you read the Bible with your spouse and your kids? Why wouldn't you pray with them? Why wouldn't you serve God together? Get doing the things that God wants you to do. So, so look at this list. Can you imagine if we had these six things, how we would never utter the word divorce ever again? If we were selfless, if we were an encourager, hard worker, good with money, compassionate, someone who really loves the Lord, their God. You would never want to let go of that person. And they would never, no, never want to let go of you as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us with our relationships to make them strong, to make them secure, 
to make you the very centerpiece of these. Lord, you're the one that holds us together. When all hell breaks loose around us, you're the peace in the midst of the storm. And so, God, I pray for couples who are really struggling right now, and they're just not seeing eye to eye on anything. I pray, God, they would go home and they would look at these six things and they would step up and they would start offering the kind of love that you've offered to them. And Lord, for all the single adults who are here who are looking for Mr. or Mrs. Right, God, please don't let them settle. May they aim high. You are God of the Almighty and nothing is impossible with you. And at the right time, in the right way, as we work on ourselves, you will bring that person into our life. Lord, we're counting on you. And you're trustworthy. You keep your word. You keep your promises. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.